Recently at Iowa State, as well as Simpson and Grinnell, Dr. David Smith discussed some of the aspects of the drug problem. Dr. Smith is medical director of the Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic and consultant on drug abuse for the Department of Psychiatry at San Francisco General Hospital. And rather than go down through the usual sort of listing of, of identification of the different drugs and some of the uh, factors involved, I'd like for you to discuss some of the things that oftentimes aren't talked about. At what point is the accurate drug information essential for our young people in their developmental stage? Well, I think the most important thing to understand is that any drug pattern is an interaction <coughs> between a chemical uh, personality and a social environment, and therefore, when you're going to educate young people about drugs, you've really got to start uh, at a time before they start thinking about taking the chemicals or experiencing the social pressures that might lead them to to use drugs. And I think that it should begin in in elementary school uh, in the Bay Area. The decision to take drugs starts about the seventh grade. So obviously, if, if you're going to have a form of conceptual drug education that is meaningful, it has to occur before the seventh grade. But it really has to be not just you know, illegal drugs. It has to also discuss what the whole act of ingesting a foreign chemical in your body means, what taking aspirin means, what smoking cigarettes means, what taking penicillin is. In other words, it has to be a conceptual thing that emphasizes all aspects of drug taking so that <clears throat> it's relevant for the young person when he is actually placed in a situation in, in which he might be tempted. And most of the young people get started on experimentation with illegal drugs because of curiosity, peer group pressure, and if you haven't worked with your young person and helped him make decisions about how to resist these things, then uh, your drug education hasn't been successful. Well, if you have given inaccurate information, then this also adds to the the fun of experimenting because uh, then the results are different from what somebody told you they would be and so why believe anything they say? Does this happen? Well this is a uh, one of the big problems with drug education as it's currently formulated is that there's a great deal of misinformation and most of the material relates to specific drug facts and then <clears throat> school administrators in particular are very anxious to make certain things seem a lot worse than they really are, particularly in the area of marijuana. So they'll throw out some uh, information that's not true, but it's scary. <clears throat> and they don't think that this matters much, but if you've then had a very good drug education program and you've talked about amphetamine and barbiturates and heroin and the real dangers of these substances, and then at a later time the young person hears or finds out one way or another that what you said about marijuana was invalid, then the reaction is to reject everything you've said. And this is one of the biggest barriers to effective drug education, the fact that young people think that we're lying to them about everything. And then they always point out certain specific bits of misinformation as a way of documenting that all of it should be rejected. And I think that <clears throat> our biggest goal in drug education is to establish credibility. And when you're speaking of, of the, uh, the results of the drug intake and the things that it can do with, with the body, I suspect that many adults are not aware of the things that happen uh, and that uh, the diet pill doesn't just take off uh, the take down the appetite and the weight, but that there are many other things that are involved and many serious consequences in the long run. Yes. All right, going on to something else that impressed me as uh, talking with you is the factor of the illegal drug market being extremely detrimental as far as again the young people because of the environment that. that 
they have to go through during their teenage and pre-teenage years in order to obtain the drug that many times they're going to be getting. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on this and, and the consequences? Of well, one of the biggest concerns of those of us that are in the treatment of young people is that although you, it's essential to have regulation of drugs and law enforcement to, a, in a, to control supply, particularly the more dangerous drugs such as heroin, barbiturates, amphetamine, um, LSD, uh, the criminalization of the drug user, in other words, treating him as a criminal, has produced, and particularly the young, many more serious consequences than the act that he's gone through. For example, any time you have a drug in large demand, then a delivery system will develop, even if you've made it illegal. We have a very naive <clears throat> feeling in the United States that if we just made a drug illegal, then it'll go away. And we should have learned that this doesn't work with prohibition, for example. That with prohibition, all we did w with prohibition was to lose control of the distribution of that drug and a huge black market developed to supply the drug. Now, there is a huge black market in marijuana. The young person that wants to buy marijuana has to enter into this illegal drug scene. He is exposed to a variety of other influences and temptations and particularly if he smokes marijuana and finds out that it didn't lead to uh, mania and all these other horrible things that he found out about uh, in the drug education uh, program at school then he's liable to say well they must have been lying to me about these other agents and certainly they're readily available uh, and then he goes on and experiments with these other things in the Bay Area for example if you legalized marijuana, you would decrease its availability, decrease its availability to minors. Because it's easier for a minor to get pot than it is booze, because there's such a huge marijuana black market. Now, our biggest concerns are not with adult marijuana use, but with minor marijuana use. We don't want young people in the formative stages of their adolescent maturation to be taking any drugs, not marijuana, not pills, not booze, not anything. And it's, of course, very difficult to try to get them through these crucial stages of adolescent maturation without them getting involved with drugs. But we're certainly not decreasing the availability, at least in the big city areas, of marijuana by making it illegal. In fact, by making a a drug that has a billion dollar market in the United States illegal. We're increasing its attractiveness by making it a forbidden fruit. We're increasing and in supporting uh, this very well organized black market distribution system and we're exposing them to uh, a system that we want to keep them out of. Well, uh, exposing them to uh, <coughs> a greater avail availability as well as to an environment that is not conducive to uh, the full development uh, as they should be developing. Right. One last thing. Do you have available a list of literature that would be on the level that uh, parents would be able to get good information? Well, the place to write for that type of information is the National Institute of Mental Health and their drug abuse section. We have literature at our clinic uh, that's a little bit more sophisticated, but I think you can get the simple literature for for parents um, and for youth in large quantity from the National Institute of Mental Health and they and they distribute it for free. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our guest has been Dr. David Smith. He is medical director of Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic and consultant on drug abuse for the Department of Psychiatry at San Francisco General Hospital. And thank you very, very you. much for taking the time.
if you go away on this beautiful day then you might as well take the sun away all the birds that flew in the summer sky when our love was new and our hearts were high when the day was young and the nights were long and the moon stood still for a night bird's song if you go away if you go away if you go away if you go away as i know you will you must tell the world to stop turning till you return again if you ever do for what good is love without loving you can i tell you now as you turn to go i'll be dying slowly to the next hello if you go away if you go away if you go away but if you stay i'll make you a day like no day has been or will be again i'll seal on your smile i'll sail on your touch i'll talk to your eyes that i love so much then if you go i'll understand leave me just enough love to fill up my hand if you go away if you go away if you go away if you go away as i know you must there'll be nothing left in the world to trust just an empty room full of empty space like that empty look i see on your face oh i'd have been the shadow of your shadow if i thought it might have kept me by your side if you go away if you go away if you go away but if you stay i'll make you a night like no night has been or will be again we'll sail on the sun we'll glide on the rain we'll talk to the trees and worship the wind then if you go go i won't cry though the good is gone from the word goodbye if you go away if you go away if you go away please don't go away These are the chief tones who are performing at the Iowa Sports and Vacation Show. And the lead guitar for the group is Jack Cecil. So Jack, why don't you first introduce the other members? All right, uh, to start with our lead singer, um, an hereditary chief from Northwestern British Columbia, a member of the Gitxan tribe from the Tsimsan nation, Chief Dahansk, our lead singer. On the bass guitar is his big little brother, uh, his name is Barry Clifford, and the fellow on the drums is Richard Dowse. Now, all of you are from British Columbia. Is this true? Yes. Mm. Northwestern British Columbia, from the uh, Nass and Skeena River areas. We, we all belong to the Tsimsan Nation, and uh, I am of the Niskat tribe, and the rest are of the Gitxan tribe. How did you get together? Did you, are you from the same area as far as, you know, did you go to school together or what? Um, 
Well, yes, uh, we spent, uh, well, I spent the last few years of my uh, education in, in northern Alberta, in Edmonton, and uh, so did the rest of the boys, and uh, this was where we got together at a student meeting of some 120 students, and uh, we were picked out at random, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, yeah. we were going to start a band, you know, start, start something to get to gain some kind of recognition and go out and foster better Indian and non-Indian relations. And uh, this was how we got our start, from this meeting, at which time the students decided to, uh, you know, to do something, to, get, to gain recognition as Indians. So you were chosen to become a band. Have you had musical uh, experience before that? Uh, no, uh, we have never had any musical lesson, lessons. <laughs> Our singer has never had any vocal lessons or any type at all. We don't know music, as a matter of fact, but we just uh, play as we feel it. And uh, uh, just for... <laughs> I wanted to say something. Our director is the one who picked us out at random. John Radcliffe is his name. He's the one that runs our sound system, and uh, he does a very good job. Now, how long ago did you become a group? Were you formed? Uh, six years ago, last week, when is it, 20, the 24th, last week, yeah. Now, have you been performing since that time, or did it take you a while to get your routines worked out? Um, well, we have been performing on and off since that time. Uh, we had our start, of course, like uh, every entertainer, I think, has had, you know, like going out and doing charity work for uh, retarded children's homes and uh, old folks' homes and hospitals and what not. Uh, we still do these whenever we get the chance to. And uh, after we had gotten started in this, we had to turn professional because we started getting paid for what we were doing. And uh, while well, we had our start in Quebec, Canada, and then moved down into the States, and since then we've been traveling throughout the United States and out of the country also. Other than sports shows of this type, what kind of things do you play right now? Well, um, we were in the middle of doing, uh, well, sports shows and just state fairs and some of the larger county fairs. And uh, every so often we do a concert on our own, at which time we do about two hours, two and a half, depending on how much music the people want from us. And uh, uh, once in a great while we would do a, night, a nightclub or a supper club. You are on the road quite a bit. How often do you get home? Well, we have been home three days in the last six years, uh, so you we're on a road on. quite a bit, about 150,000 miles a year. What kind of music do you play? Oh, we play everything from Brahms to the Beatles, uh, just everything. Uh, to name some examples, we do country and western, like, uh, you know, some of the tunes that Johnny Cash has brought out, like uh, Folsom Prison Blues. I would do something real Western, like uh, uh, the old Hank Williams grace, like Your Cheating Heart and stuff like that. And then we do religious numbers, very deep numbers, like I Believe and You'll Never Walk Alone, uh, One God. I don't know if you've ever heard that number, but it's a very beautiful number. And we also do some novelty tunes, like Alley Oop and stuff like that, you know, whenever we can put them in. All kinds. Okay, yeah. this is the Chief Tones.
Good afternoon. I'm Connie Pratt. Today we're visiting at the North Polk Community High School and the junior high class, the eighth graders there, are hooking rugs. The instructor is Mrs. Mary Anderson and this is the art class. How long have they been working on these rugs? Probably about two weeks by now. It takes quite a while to do these. It's not hard at all. It just takes time. How did they start figuring out their pattern first? Um, I was actually stressing design when I gave this problem. This is what I want the junior high to learn most of all, our fundamentals of design. And um, I want them to learn that everything must have a center of interest in a design. And also they were working with a color problem. Mm -hmm. So this kind of solved two different things I wanted them to learn this uh, nine weeks. Have any of your classes ever done this kind of thing before? No, this is the first time I've presented this. Um, it was pretty much up to the girls if they wanted to spend the money for the yarn and uh, the burlap and have something really nice looking when they got through. And then the school bought the frames yeah. and they bought the, the hooks? the frames and the hooks. Okay. Let's start by talking with the different girls in the class. Come on this side of you. Could you please tell us what your name is and what town you're from? I'm Mary Boda from Polk City. Okay. What kind of a design is this? Is it any particular thing or is it just kind of an abstract? It's just any design. Just a design. What kind of colors are you using for someone oh, who might not? A yellow and blue and green and a burgundy. burgundy. How much time have you spent on this? You've been working on it quite a while. You take it home with you? Yeah, I take it home with me. Could you tell us who you are and where you're from? I'm Debbie Goat from Polk City. Okay, Debbie. What's your pattern? How would you describe it? Oh, it's kind of like stained glass windows. That's what it's supposed to look like anyway. Now, your teacher said you should have a center of interest. What's your center of interest? How can you describe oh, that? I might put just a different color in here that'll stand out from all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, what colors are you using? Got a brown and a... Orange and green and purple and yellow and red and blue and darker greens. How do you decide what colors will work together? Do you have a color wheel or something, or are you just picking what you like together? Just pick what you think goes good together. Okay. This one I can see already is going to be a peace symbol when it's done. Who are you? Kathy Hyshew. Where are you from, Kathy? Polk City. Boy, a lot of you are from, all, are all of you from Polk City? No. Just most of you, huh? Okay, do you have to use a special kind of yarn when you make something like this? Yeah, you've got to use um, rug yarn. Where can you buy that? Almost any where they sell yarn. Okay. And just regular canvas you're using, right? Particular size or just to match your frame? Mm, yeah. Okay. There is a, a particular type of rug canvas you can use that is more closely woven. However, I think burlap suited us just fine <coughs> in price and uh, for beginning workmanship. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who are you, please? Mary Wright. Where are you from, Mary? Polk City. Another one. Yeah. Okay, now yours is different from the other ones that we've looked at so far. It's got letters on it. Yeah. You have to do something different when you're working with letters? Well, when you draw it on here, you have to draw it on backwards. Right. We've got to remember that you're doing the backs of your yeah. rugs. Is yours going to be a rug, or are you going to use it as a wall hanging? Wall or hanging. You, wall hanging. Okay. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Neva Sash. Where are you from, Neva? Sheldon. Okay. What kind of a tool is it that you're using? This, uh, what do you call it? Hooks. It's a hook. Uh -huh. It's for hooking rugs. What's the little piece of wire there for? What's this that do? This keeps it from going down too far and makes the loops too big. Mm -hmm. You have to punch it all the way down to that little wire thing. Right. Or it, what happens then? Is it uneven on the other side? Yeah, sometimes they get longer and sometimes they come undone. Mm -hmm. You're going to make yours as a wall hanging or a rug? Wall hanging. Wall hanging. Okay. Do you put it in a different frame after you're done with it then or what? Well, sometimes you can, but... Or you can just leave it without a frame on it at all? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hello. Who are you? Cheryl Murrell. Where are you from, Cheryl? Oak City. Mm-hmm. What can you tell us about your design? Is it all going to be in this blue and green? Or have yes. you got another color? Just those two? Mm-hmm. You like those two, huh? Or does your mother like them? I like them. Is yours going to be a wall hanging? Yes. Okay. How do you get the canvas or the burlap into the frame? Is there a special way you have to do it? We um, stapled it mm -hmm. on. 
Do you start, you know, on the edge and go all the way around mm -hmm. when you're stapling? You don't have to stretch it or anything particularly, huh? Yeah, stretch it. Okay. Hi. Hi. Who are you, please? Cindy Lamb. Where are you from, Cindy? Pug City. Another one. The yeah. whole bunch is here. Yours is a bluebird. Yeah. Now, yours has spaces in it. Is that, you want it that way in, in the bird? No, I didn't. Or will you fill them in? Yeah, I'll fill them in. Is it possible to make a mistake when you're doing one of these? Yeah. How do you fix it then? Just can you take the the um, yarn out? Yeah. Okay. I think there have been several of them who have pulled things out and started over again. But that's not quite a hard good enough to please them. It's not a hard process to take it out though. No. Okay. Oops, I just want to be on this side. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Sue Shelwell. And you've got a cold, don't you, Sue? Yeah. <laughs> you're losing your voice. Yours is kind of a looks kind of like a flower. But it's just abstract, isn't it? Yes. It's not really anything particular. What colors have you got in yours? Oh, tangerine, <coughs> green. Uh, kind of a beige. beige. Yeah. What color will you put on the outside here, the kind of background? It's tangerine. I see. It's going to be that orange all the way around. OK. Why don't you show that design? I think it's quite uh, okay. good. OK. Can you flip it so that we can? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's pretty colors especially. Yeah. You like those colors or does your mother like it? Yeah, kind of. Real pretty. Mm -hmm. And who are you? I'm Kathy Murphy. Where are you from, Kathy? Polk City. Okay. <laughs> What's your design? Mine's a flower. Okay. What colors? You've got purple and green so far. Are you going to use anything else on yours? I'm going to have a light blue background and then a dark blue. Mm -hmm. How'd you go about deciding on your design? Oh, I saw some pictures in magazines and decided to use it. Flower. Reminded you of the flower. What's yours going to be? A wall hanging too? Yeah. Okay. We have a finished product here to look at, which will give us a better idea of what it will look like when the girls are done. This one you use as a wall hanging, is that right? Yes. I actually made this for my sister, and I just robbed her of it again so <laughs> I could show the girls what they'd actually be uh, having when they're finished. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're working on something like this and it takes so long, and uh, it is a good uh, project to do when you're watching TV, you can punch along. And <laughs> Which you need a little mm -hmm. encouragement when yeah. you're starting. <laughs> so I think this uh, kind of set them off better when they saw what they were going to wind up with. Now, will they put this fringe around theirs probably when they're done? I think so. I think it's the best way to really finish off these designs. The burlap uh, will be folded over and hemmed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I took uh, another type of stitch with yarn and using about four strands and a great big tapestry needle, um, put it through, just mm -hmm. like when you make a shag rug. Now, if you wanted to make a rug from this, what would you have to do to make it work as a rug? Um, I would take it somewhere to a rug factory or rug lining mm -hmm. company, and they usually uh, seal the back of it with a type of rubber or latex plastic coating. And it seals it real well, and it makes it non-skid, like a lot of rugs are today. And uh, it also keeps from keeps these loops from being pulled out so easily. Because if one pulls, the whole string comes out? Right. OK. So now these are a little more fragile than other kinds. OK, you have a more sturdy mm -hmm. rug. And this one is a rug, not a wall hanging. Well, I like that it as a wall hanging. I think I feel like the girls. If I put that much trouble into it, I'm not sure I want to walk all over it. So. <laughs> Um, I have had this hanging, but this is more of a shag uh, rug stitch, and it is more permanent because you take a couple of stitches in it. Uh, it's really bound into the burlap instead of just punched in with a needle, mm -hmm. like this rug hooking procedure is. You have to use a different kind of tool when you do this then? Yes, this is just uh, with a great big tapestry needle, and they're just, as, just like any other needle, only they have a, they're much longer and they have a big eye in them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, it's just a particular stitch you take. It's not very hard at all once you catch on. It does take much more yarn to do this because they are longer shags, longer strings, than it does to do a hooking. How much yarn are these girls probably using on their hangings? Well, it varies. If they're using a lot of colors, they probably aren't using um, much more than a skein of each color. And if they're using only like two colors, like Sherry was, I believe, she'll be using much more. Mm -hmm as far as skeins go. Depends on how many colors they're using. 
They look like they're working out pretty well. Yeah, Are it's they really keeping them busy. Is this a project you think you'll present other classes in the future? I think so, if they're willing. Like I say, it's, it uh, takes a lot of time and, and expense on their part. And if they really want to do it, then I'm glad to show them how. Okay. Because I enjoy it myself. <laughs> this looks like a good project that you might want to try yourself. If these gals can do it, then I'm sure you can.